Thank you. Anybody else? Prayer requests, praise before we get in the word tonight. All right, hang on to your lists and we'll uh, have an opportunity to pray uh, with them after. I want you to open your Bibles again tonight uh, to the book of, uh, uh, of 1 Peter. Uh, we'll start where we uh, were at last week, chapter 3 and verse 15. We'll only refer to that. We won't, of course, be in the whole passage, but 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13. And uh, we're going to continue on sort of building the foundation and the part so we can do some uh, work in apologetics. We'll talk about that again momentarily. So just one verse tonight, uh, and we'll stay seated, but it's this verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And we're going to kind of take off from there tonight and uh, want to establish a couple more things in our lives. Let's pray together. Father, thank you again for our time. Pray you bless now the preaching of your word, and uh, Lord, uh, the teaching. I pray, God, that it would be clear, and that we would profit from it, and we would be a better uh, testimonies. We'd be more effective testimonies as the days go forward. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to try to do that. Oh, hey, you already did that. Thank you very much. But, um, oh, i got to turn it on. Sure, that's what they all say. So uh, we're going to, the second uh, one tonight, we're going to talk about the necessity of apologetics. I want to remind you that we defined ap apologetics. I don't think I actually did a, another slide for that tonight, but I think it works. Oh, I did. There you go. Uh, apologetics is an attempt to remove obstacles or doubts to, as well as offer positive reasons for believing that Christianity is true. And so, uh, you know this, uh, I think we should all understand this, that there are lots of obstacles that are presented to people who need the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to think about it for a minute and tell me what are some of those obstacles that people face? What puts obstacles in their way and what do those obstacles look like that need to be overcome that they might be able to come to faith in Christ? Anybody at all? This is about thinking, by the way. Questions are not about right answers. They're about thinking and considering what we're doing. What kind of obstacles and where do they come from? Yes, sir. Perceived okay. So perceived hypocrisy from people. And, and we kind of dealt with that when we said the foundation is the life that they see. Yes, sir. Oh. Yeah, I think the culture both presents obstacles to faith and is an obstacle to faith because it is so far away from truth. And in fact, here's what makes the obstacle worse. This is the exponential power that we still often believe that our culture is what it was 30 years ago. And while we know it's not, we act like it is. And our culture is not that. This is a, they would say, some would say a post-Christian nation. This is a godless culture today. We live in the day that the Bible describes that they'll call wrong right and right wrong. And it is more uh, it is obstacle, it is more uh, offensive to much of our nation to do right in the name of Christ than to, to, to do wrong for any sake at all. And it is a huge obstacle to faith. Good. What else? Anybody else? Yes, sir. Religion. Yeah, religion itself is a huge obstacle to faith. Because what religion does is make up another God and then put it in the place and hold it as equal. And when you have a God that you make up, that's a God that you control, and that is an obstacle to people giving their life to a true and living God. Doug, I think you had your hand up. Sure, yeah, false gospels, amen. All of these things are obstacles. Anybody think of any others? Yes, ma'am. Pride, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we don't need God. Yes, sir? Indoctrination. Indoctrination. Okay. Uh, that's an interesting thing uh, that you just said there because the truth is, is that we do have a, a governmental bent against faith and Christianity today. A governmental bent. Thank you. Anybody else? I think I saw another hand. Yes, ma'am. 
The internet, yeah, boy. The internet can be a huge obstacle to faith. The internet can be a huge obstacle to brain, you know, just having a brain, I mean. And, uh, and I don't think the internet's wicked. I think that, uh, that we don't have the critical skills and the moral, uh, ethical strength to, to do the right thing uh, when we're alone too often, but good, good. All of these things are obstacles. And here we are, if you think about it, that we have a simple gospel, don't we? Uh, there's more. Uh, kind of, you know, the idea of culture, that's pretty big. Do you know that, that atheism is probably the fastest growing philosophy or worldview that people live by in our country today? Agnosticism to some degree, but, uh, but atheism where they just would say, you can't prove there's a God, there is no God. And I'm telling you that the generation that's coming right along, the, the college age generation today, uh, it is filled with this. They're being taken away from us by uh, these false worldviews built on untruth. Okay. I believe that every generation of believers has a duty to leave behind it this one thing, another generation of believers. But we have obstacles in that way. And so all of those things are there between a people and believing that Christianity is true. In fact, in our, in our country today, Christianity has just become another, and it's nowhere near the top of the list. And it has no thing. So apologetics, we're not just talking about some goofy thing that was some goofy word. Apologetics is really about outreach. And it is how we are uh, learn to overcome obstacles uh, to faith and even those who would, uh, who would uh, deny those things, that we will learn how to reason from Scripture with those things. Now, uh, we need a better clicker. Hit that button back there. Space bar. Did we just lose? Okay, well, maybe they'll catch up. What I want to tell you tonight is that, that apologetics is a necessity, okay? It's the title of the message. It all makes sense. And here's the reason that I give you that title of the message is this, that we, we have a reasonable faith, okay? Well, what we hold as Christians is really the only reasonable worldview. Now, uh, folks, let's be clear on this, though it may not have been taught this way often. You cannot separate the faith once delivered from a worldview, We've talked some about a worldview in the past, and, and clearly our faith is a worldview, a worldview. And our faith is reasonable, and it's rational worldview. And really, that's what 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 tells us briefly. It's this, that the answer to all of these obstacles is an apologetic. It's, uh, it's the word, uh, the, it's really the word is literally directly from a Greek word, and it just means this, that to, to, give, a, to give a reason or to give, a, to give an answer, to give an account for those things. And in 1 Peter 3.15, he says this, and you know this in kind of the foundation verse maybe for this series, but, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope is in you with meekness and in fear. And we looked at meekness and in fear specifically specifically last week but I just want you to understand that what we're doing when we confront people is not just coming up with answers that are rote or that we uh, that we have said since we were little kids many of us raised in Christianity uh, some of us not but instead we're told to give an answer okay reason answer is the word apologia okay it's an apologetic it's an answer and really it's more than just a, an answer to quiet the conversation but it's a reason okay it says a reason that that it's an account an explanation of truth and and uh and logic with clarity that's a reason and we're called in the word of god that when someone would inquire or when we would cause the inquiry even for the reason that we have hope that we're to give them an answer with reason. We're to give them that and we can do that. We can give clear answers because we have a rational, logical faith. And so uh, it all really makes sense. So a few things for you tonight. Get ready to work. We got some scriptures to go to. The first point that I want to make to you tonight is this. I've said it, but I'll say it again. We hold a cohesive and rational faith. 
Now, this cannot be said, I believe, of any other worldview philosophy that exists in the planet today. I would tell you today that uh, nothing else makes sense. The atheist has to prove his case that there is no God by making, and that everything is um, tangible or everything is physical, present, by making reference to things that aren't present. It becomes circular logic and thinking in their life. But the Christian worldview is reasonable. It's rational. And I want to give you some reasons from Scripture that we know, that we can understand that what we believe is rational faith. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 this evening. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'm going to read with you uh, just... Uh, we're going to begin to read in verse 3, and it says this, For though we walk in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled we hold a reasonable a rational uh, body of belief the faith once delivered and I would describe it this way reasonable tonight that the Christian worldview is a powerful worldview it's really the only powerful worldview listen to the words in these two verses that we read that I'm going to point out verse four says the weapons of our warfare Verse three, we do not war after the flesh. How many would you agree that those are issues of might on might conflict? That there, is a, that there is a battle that goes on, this being a spiritual battle, that requires power and might to win it. And our faith, we don't have that power, but our worldview or the Christian worldview is a, a worldview that is powerful. Let me try this again and see if it works. How do you like that? One at a time. Hit it again. Hit it again. There you go. See how easy that is? You just try to stay up with me tonight, okay? <laughs> what else? War after the flesh. Weapons. Warfare. Verse 4. But mighty through God. And they accomplish something to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations. Bringing into captivity, verse 5, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Having a readiness to revenge all disobedience. Folks, that's just power. That the weapons that we do warfare in, and of course our weapon, we have one offensive weapon, don't we? And that's the Word of God, from which comes the Christian worldview, the biblical worldview. And our faith, the faith wants to live in, and they're mighty. And that they pull those things down. Let me tell you something else about the Christian uh, worldview or our faith once delivered. Go to, with me to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians and chapter number five. It is powerful. The second thing that I want you to know tonight is that the Christian worldview or our faith is testable. It is testable. In the book of, of 1 Thessalonians and chapter number five, the Bible says this beginning in verse number 14. And now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow after that which is good, both among yourself and to all men. So I want you to know that as he wraps up this book, ultimately, in verse 14, he begins to give this series of directives, okay? Uh, their, their, their commands, their uh, imperatives that we're to do. And the list kind of gets a little faster as we we go along verse 16 rejoice evermore verse 17 pray without ceasing verse 18 in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you uh, quench not the spirit verse 19 so despise not prophesying verse 20 and all of these are things in case you haven't figured it out that are not optional things like I would like a uh, I would like my Christian life to be a convertible or with a manual transmission and no prayer time at all uh, no no these are all things that we're commanded to do by him but look at the next one in verse number uh, verse number 21 prove all things 
You see that? It's testable. And that's literally the word, uh, what it means, and you all already know this. But we're to, we're to prove, to learn, here's exactly, to learn the genuineness of an item by examination and testing. Okay? Uh, uh, try, the Bible says, that we uh, should taste and see that the Lord is good and that we can test our worldview. And the Christian worldview holds up. It's not circular in logic. It's not illogical. It's not based upon uh, simple uh, things that can't be demonstrated uh, by faith, certainly, but it is a testable worldview. And we've been commanded to prove it, to try it, to test it, to examine it, to lean upon it and see that it's actually true. We have a real reasonable faith that we follow it is powerful and it is testable uh, titus chapter 1 in verse number 9 titus chapter 1 in verse number 9 the bible says this holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers here's the third thing that the christian worldview we hold is practical Okay? That it is the instrument that we can use by holding fast the word of God that we have and that we can by sound doctrine or teaching from that exhort and convince the gainsayers. Gainsayers are those who contradict, deny, or oppose. Okay? Gainsayers are those who say there is no God. Gainsayers are those described in Romans chapter 1 where who knowing the truth right uh, didn't want the truth and they became worse and worse all the time as God turned them over to a reprobate mind knowing the tr truth of God denied it in their life and and uh, gave their lives over they're gainsayers and this says here's how practical this is that the very content of our body of faith and the document that it comes from the source which is the word of God that it is so practical that the thing they deny is the thing that we use in order to exhort, that means to comfort them, and to, uh, what's the second word there? Pardon me. To exhort and to convince. And of course, convince means this. It's interesting. To lay it bare or to expose it. Listen to this. Here's how practical it is. That you don't really need anything else except an understanding of the Word of God. And that doesn't mean that we don't read books. We're not those people who burn uh, most books, um, but um, uh, good books. How about that? No, no, no. We can learn about them. We do use other things to teach us about the Word of God, don't we? But it's the Word of God that lays bare the untruth of every other worldview. How about the one that says we get reincarnated several times until we uh, ultimately end up in the right perfect state? How about that one? I'm not quite sure how coming back as a bug helps you to correct the errors you made as a human, but uh, let's hope that doesn't last long because, you know, bug zappers are pretty much universal these days, and that's, that's just a bad, whole bad scene. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is that we hold a faith that's so practical that the truth of our belief is the very thing that comforts those who are struggling and lays bare the untruth of the gainsayer the one who opposes us. The, the, the worldview, the faith that we hold is powerful and testable and it's very practical. Uh, here's the third one, 1 Peter 3.15. We've been there, we've sort of talked about it. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason. Here's what I tell you. It's rational. You, do, do you know that there's never an answer uh, to the question for the reason of the faith that lies within you? that you have to give that says this, I don't know, that's just what they tell us. Well, because I'm a Christian, that's probably one of the worst answers we can give. I'll give you one that's worth, well, beca worse, because I'm a Baptist. I don't do this or I do do this because I'm a Baptist. That's not why I really do anything. I'm a Baptist because of what that book teaches me. I'm a Christian because I learned from that book that I was a sinner and needed a savior and that there was one for me, and his name was Christ, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm humbled, and I'm honored to be called a Christian, or one like Christ, and I strive, and hope you do, to wear that, wear that uh, descriptor 
with great, uh, with great holiness. But understand this, that it's, it's rational, that we don't have to, uh, we don't have to run around. The, could you uh, explain to me, uh, uh, I probably don't want to get into all this tonight, but could you explain to me how it's possible that there's a little bit of God in everything? And how everything is God? And that each one of us really is some manifestation of God? so that you can stand beside Shirley MacLaine out on the beach and yell this in new age uh, thinking, I am God. Do you, do you understand there's nothing rational at all? The ends don't connect. The logic doesn't flow from one to the other in a new age or cosmic humanist worldview. In, in fact, there's nothing logical, there's nothing rational about a humanist worldview that says everything begins and ends with man and the highest good is that which is best for man's happiness. Son, that's circular logic if you ever wanted to think about it. And it's completely unreasonable to think that. In fact, man does nothing but devolve to the lowest common denominator. And it's always wickedness, except Christ through Christianity would intervene. We uh, have been given a faith, a worldview that's rational. We have a cohesive and reasonable and rational worldview. Let me give you one more. The Christian worldview endures every attack. Go to the book of Jude quickly with me in verse number three. Jude, verse number three. Here's what it says there. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to you to write of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you would earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Jude said, I wanted to write something to rejoice in our common salvation, but it was needful for me to write to you that you needed to do what's necessary to defend the faith. And here's why he says that. Because from the very beginning, I mean from the first promise of redemption in the Garden of Eden, the truth that God lays down has been under attack. From the very beginning, listen, uh, Seth uh, was uh, the, now the line. There's always been an attack before Christ was born on the bloodline that would bring him about. And now there's been an attack on the veracity or the reality of whether who he was and whether he actually died, and whether he actually came. And it's all a big myth. And there's a battle to be fought. But the Christian worldview endures every attack. And the reason that it does that is because we have a rational, cohesive a worldview that's powerful, testable, practical in order to, to uh, give an answer, to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason. There is a truth answer for every accusation in this battle. And I would tell you that a worldview or a body of belief that does not, is not powerful, is not testable, is not practical, is not rational, can never endure attacks. It will ultimately be found to, be, to, be, to fall short of what it is. Could I talk to you about 99 virgins from blowing yourself up? Does that sound like a logical thing? It's not built on anything except the weird, perverted thoughts of one man. And it can't be proven. It can't stand up to the attacks of truth and rationality and logic. Now, Christian, I need to remind you that we've been given a mind and we've been given a mind to use it to love our God. In fact, in the book of Matthew, it says that we're to love our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind and the days have to be gone can i tell you that we've been on a bad journey in america and in america christianity and i can tell you that there was a time and many of you lived in it probably more than i did that uh when when christian people in general could stand up and actually uh, give a reason for the hope that lied within them that we taught and they believed truth theologies that they understood uh, the foundations of our faith, not just the answers of the junior church. And we have greatly in our churches dumbed down uh, the, the general uh, maturity and understanding and biblical thinking of the members of our churches. And that's not an insult, it's simply an observation from being around uh, churches for so long. 
And we've got to get back to the place where we understand this, that we have a rational, a logical, a cohesive, uh, a, a defendable, a declarable body of belief or worldview. And we've got to constantly be renewing our minds. The transformation of our life is done, according to Romans 1, through the renewing of our mind, that by that we might prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And uh, we have the best material in the world, if I can say it that way, upon which to demonstrate the wonder of the mind and that our worldview, our God, our body of faith, that being a Christian is the greatest choice and the only logical worldview you can adopt in your life. Go to the next slide, if you would. I have a quote for you from a man by the name of Jeffrey Johnson. If you can read that, just soak it in. He describes this and he says, Christianity... He wrote a book called The Absurdity of Unbelief. Christianity is the only worldview that is intellectually and practically defensible, for it is the only worldview that can give a coherent answer to why there are logical and ethical absolutes. We do not have absolutes that come out of nowhere. We have ethical absolutes that are given to us by a divine being who though he never asks us to prove us, there is plenty of evidence for his existence that we'll look at later. And we have, we have a rational, uh, a, a logical, a cohesive a body of beliefs. Now it's not the rationality or the logic that makes them true. They're true because of where they came from and what they are. But they are the only worldview View. You can read every other worldview that you want to read, including some who call themselves Christian but really hold a different worldview than what the Bible would teach. And all of them somewhere fall short, they circle back, and they demonstrate that they're not cohesive and thereby they're no, of no value to build a life on that would last forever. We have a reasonable, rational, cohesive faith. And we therefore we therefore have not only a, a reason, but we have the ability with that to give an answer, a reason, to an apologetic. We can explain why we believe what we believe. We can explain from our worldview, from the Bible, why we live like we live. We can c explain why we don't do or are not the same people that we used to be before we came to Christ. There is a reasonable answer. We have a reasonable faith and we can give a reason for our faith from the very tenets of our faith. Now here's the second thing that I want you to learn tonight. That being prepared to give an answer is of vital importance. It should be the next slide. The being prepared, nope, that's okay, but we'll stay there, is of vital importance. And here's why, it's what's up there. Because apologetics is ultimately necessary for the Great Commission. Now, uh, we all understand the Great Commission. The Great Commission is about winning people, about baptizing people, and about discipling people. And if in all of that, what we are doing is we're extending to them the truth of the faith once delivered. When we talk to people with the gospel, we're extending to them the truth of that worldview or that body of belief that God has given us, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no argument in that for us because it's established upon the truth of the word of God and the evidence of every man's life, isn't it? That there's none righteous, no, not one. And so uh, we are extending to everyone all the way throughout the Great Commission. And when we deal even after salvation, there's an apologetic issue to discipleship often because people come from all sorts of belief systems. And you know that we're not called to take one belief system and another belief system and try to mix them in and make them compatible with Christianity. That has already been tried. It was tried in the, uh, by Constantine. He's the one that really did it with Christianity first, I believe. And out of that came the Roman Catholic Church. But what did they do? Okay, Not picking on them, but I'm just going to tell you the truth. They took some things that came out of early Christianity and they mixed them with a lot of, uh, of uh, heathenism and idolatry and mysticism. And that's why you have all that you have. And when they did that, they changed Christianity. Friend, I'm going to tell you this, that according to the Bible, that the Catholic Church is not a Christian church. They're not. They say that, and it's an obstacle. It's exactly what we heard about. It's religion that's an obstacle. 
And, and there's a necessity that you and I prepare ourselves to be ready to give this answer. And it's got to be more than because. And I know that you already know that. Because it's necessary for the Great Commission. Just three things that I want to tell you. Here's number one. Our faith is objective, not subjective. Because of the belief that it's founded on the Word of God, our faith is objective, not subjective. Okay, this one is a test. Sorry, that's the way it goes sometimes. Jeff, tell me what does it mean to be objective? Okay, I'll come back to one. Uh, tell me what it means to be subjective. It can change because it's not based upon any sort of evidence. It's based upon uh, uh, feeling, okay, or, uh, or supposition, but it's not based upon anything that's unchangeable. So if you feel like this is true, and I know that I'm being very general about this, but if you feel it, tomorrow you won't feel like it. And it'll change. And that's subjectivity, that, it's, that, it, uh, that it can change with any given change in anything. Uh, objective means this uh, on the next part, that objective is based upon evidence or knowledge. Okay? No, no. We walk by faith, but our faith is built, built upon evidence and knowledge. Listen to this. Here's the, here's the line of faith that a person would need to walk through in order to be born again. Step one, knowledge. They have to learn from somewhere that they're in need of a Savior and that there's a Savior available to them and that they can place their trust in Him. And that's the knowledge that's developed. And of course, that comes from our Bible, from the worldview that we've been given in the Word of God. And the next step of it is assent. Assent means that I agree that that knowledge that I've gained is true and right and should be followed. Let me tell you who gives assent to Jesus Christ. The devils. The devils believe also and yet are lost. Because while they give mental assent, there is a Christ. We saw it with the demoniac there, didn't we, of Gadara, I guess, when he crossed over and that man is sitting there and can't be uh, bound and uh, he's out of his mind. And when Jesus begins to come to him, he comes to Jesus and the demons that are in him say this, we know who you are. They know that he's the son of God. They know that he's God manifest in the flesh. They say it in Paul's ministry and uh, some of those who tried to cast out demons and the demons said to the people there, Paul we know, Jesus we know, we have no idea who you are. They not only know, but they've given assent. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is all of that. They know that. Because knowledge and assent do not bring us to faith that changes our life. And that requires something that is so solid in our life or objective, not subjective. There will, we are willing to place all of our life, all of our future, all of our eternity, all of our desires and dreams upon him. And that is the gospel, and it is by that we appropriate it. It's when we say this, listen, I know that it's true. There's no doubt about it. I learned it. I agree with it. That's a sin. And now I need Jesus to be my Savior. And we humble ourselves and turn from our sin and ask him to come into our heart and forgive us. That's appropriation or being born again. You don't get there simply by this. It is not subjective. When you say this, listen, a big trend in Christianity today is to remove uh, God or Jesus from conversations where they belong. So they'll always address Jesus, but not God, or they'll address God when they should be talking about Jesus. Say, preacher, well, aren't you being a little nitpicky? You might call me being nitpicky. I'm just telling you that they're subjective about the divine being. I want to tell you that, that Jesus is God and the Father is God, and yet there's a role of the triune God in all things, and there's a role for the Son and the Spirit, and I'm glad that all of them, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, are always faithful to accomplish their roles and their promises in my life. And so, listen, we are based upon evidence. Turn to 1 John chapter 1, and we'll see this very quickly, and I'll move on. We're almost done. Sorry, but you got my dander up tonight. <clears throat> Verse 1 of John, 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the, from the beginning, listen, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. For the life was manifest, and we have seen it, and bear witness to show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. 
that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye may also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Objective. Our faith is, to, to a degree, and this Bible is an eyewitness account of the life and crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have never once been called as Christians to be blind followers or to be mindless subjects, to be people who are robotic and just take commands and do them because somebody told us that somebody told us. We have a body of verifiable evidence uh, in the Bible. This book is true. They've done everything that's humanly possible to prove this tr book wrong, and they're gone, and this book still stands. And it is the evidence for an objective faith, not a subjective faith, a faith based upon evidence. And faith, in fact, is evidence of things uh, hope for substance of things for, hope for evidence of things not seen our faith it's so important when we c uh, go out that we declare a real objective solid unchangeable faith that can change you but you can never change it our faith is objective not subjective here's the second thing that objective faith alone can endure unchanged it is only that. Punch the button back there. Uh, 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 one more time. Oh, sorry, I skipped over one. The impact of our testimony depends upon apologetics. This passage is Jesus with the disciples at Caesarea Philippi. You remember that? Matthew 16. What's the first question Jesus asked them? At Caesarea Philippi. Okay, it's this question. Who do men say that I am? And the answer, some say you're Elias. Some say you're one of the prophets. Some say, and none of them were right. And then he said to Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon bar for flesh and blood, not subjective, hath not revealed it unto you, but our Father which is in heaven. And though it came by faith, it is still uh, not subjective. Faith is not subjective, it is objective. And the impact of our testimony depends on being able to remove obstacles in people's lives to them believing uh, on Christ and becoming a Christian. And then um, here's number three. False teaching abounds in and out of church. False teaching abounds in and out of church. You're right there, so let's look at 1 Peter chapter number five, if you would with me, uh, very quickly, the first four verses. The elders who are among you I, uh, I exhort, who am also an elder, <clears throat> and a witness of the suffering of Christ, eyewitness account, and also partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for lo filthy lucre, but of a, of a willing mind. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now jump down uh, to the next chapter, to Second Peter uh, chapter, I'm sorry, two chapters chapter 2 and verse number 1 here he's told build up the people build them on truth uh, feed them that they might grow but in 2nd Peter chapter 2 and verse number 1 the Bible says this let me find chapter 2 but there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of and uh, and we'll stop reading there and he says this listen Peter you've got to build these people up on the truth that you've received, the faith once delivered, because both inside and outside of the church there will be constant false teaching. Listen, Skagit Valley, we are absolutely a target for false teaching from the enemy. And part of apologetics is not just the reaching part of the Great Commission, but it's the growing part of the Great Commission. And we need to be ready to give an answer even to those who claim to be Christian and it's not our place to pretend like we can look on the heart, but we can tell truth 
because we have a reasonable, rational, logical, cohesive faith given to us that can be tested, that's powerful, that is objective, not subjective, and that the impact of the testimony of truth is the thing that changes lives, that when because of that they turn to Jesus in faith, their lives are saved and changed. And we have to be constantly ready to give an answer. Listen to this. Great theological battles exist in our day. Some of them more common than others. One of them we talked about a bunch last fall. And that's Reformed theology. Calvinism. It is a false teaching. It is an unbiblical teaching. And it is a common thing in our age. We have to be ready to give an answer to every man that asks. You're going to, and you have already, encountered people who say, oh, you go to church, I go to church. And they're Calvinist, and they know it. And they don't agree with you. And we have a tendency to let uh, those things just pass by. I'm not talking about starting fights. I'm talking about reasoning, giving a reason, an answer to every man who asks the reason for the faith that lies in us. We have to be ready because it's the apologetic. It's the being able to give an answer. It's necessary in our lives for the accomplishment of the Great Commission. If we do not have answers, then the answers of the false truths capture their lives. And when our answers are as illogical as theirs, because we are not prepared to give an apologetic, a reason, a rational, cohesive, logical reason for why we are who we are and what we believe, we forfeit the power of truth in their life And they now just pick based upon, well, what's the most common reason people pick churches today? I want to go to that church because of, there's probably two or three. What's one? I love their music. Even when it's good music, people sometimes come here, not because of our truth, but because they like hymns. We need to be ready to get, what's another reason? The pastor? Well, yes. Yes. I'm sure you're probably right. Makes them feel good. Yeah. Yeah. The programs. Yeah, the programs. Number one question, what do you have for my children? Number one question. In fact, I would tell you, we sort of tipped some things on their ear some years ago, and I know our time is long gone, but because we stopped our junior church for a while. We stopped it because it felt like we were losing those kids when they got out of junior church. And we said to the parents, we're going to give you the number one thing that I could ever give you as your pastor. And that's the ability to teach your children to worship the Lord. We have to be careful with those things. We have to be careful. Because everybody's looking for a program. In fact, most churches, maybe we'll do this out of practicality sake, but you walk in, you check your children in, and they go over there, and you go over there, and you theoretically meet up with them when you're done. And if you don't, we sell them babies eBay. It's hot on Sunday afternoons, just like that, you know. Of course we don't. I'm not against children's programs. Hope you're not either. I am against, I am against determining where we get fed for eternity based upon very temporal things. And we have to be ready to give an answer Say, preacher, I don't think I know how. Okay, well, we're gonna go through a whole bunch of this, okay? It's gonna be slow because of the nature of this service and the length of it. But we're gonna talk about how we can give an answer, how we can argue for God's existence and for the work of Christ and for the veracity of the Bible and that it's real and true and can change your life. And we're gonna, by God's grace, equip ourselves to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks a reason reason of the hope that lieth in us, okay? So you're gonna have to bring your pencils and your maybe notebooks and your Bibles, but we're gonna do the work and we're going to, Lord willing, be able to walk out there and win folks based upon truth that is objective, unchanging, but life-changing. Amen? So, We have a foundation. We understand the importance of it. 
And now we begin to work. This is a necessity. We don't have to call it apologetics. I'll make you feel better. I don't know if I want any of that apologetic stuff. People have said, you've probably heard it, I'm not going to apologize for my faith. That is not what apologetics is. It is an answer. An answer. And we have the best answer. We have Jesus and the perfect settled word of God upon which our faith, our worldview, at least ought to be built. Isn't that right? And we're going to try our best with God's help to do exactly that. Father, thank you for our time. I pray you bless in Jesus' name. Amen. I know you have your prayer uh, sheets. I know it's kind of late, but I would encourage you maybe to take a minute or so and pray with somebody over the needs on the list, and then you'll be dismissed.